Good morning, Year 9. Uh, welcome back to the Paper 2 module. Um, we finished with uh, Lamb to the Slaughter now. We're going to do another story by the same author, Roald Dahl, who you might know is famous for writing children's stories, but also writes these rather wonderful grown-up stories. Anyway, uh, you're going to need a pen, your exercise book, a highlighter and a copy of the story, which I've attached to class charts. So when you've got all that, come back uh, and write Narrative Hooks and Skin by Roald Dowell as your title into your books and underline it. And then on to the next slide. Now, this is entirely a matter of your opinion, but what do you think makes a good story opening? Do you like the action to start straight away? Do you like it to be funny? Do you like it to be um, slightly confusing or mysterious so it draws you in? Just write down your favourite way that you like a story to open. Now, narrative hook. What do you think a narrative hook is? Well, a narrative hook is the thing that you were thinking about a minute ago, uh, the uh, opening of a story, the part of a story at the beginning that makes you want to read on. Writers spend more, <coughs> more time on their opening page than they do on any other page in a book, because if, you don't, if you're not hooked by the end of it, you're not going to read on. So a narrative hook is a device used by a writer to grab the reader's attention. And this is what I want you to think about when you do your own writing. You know, make the opening of your stories very exciting. And there are lots of different types of narrative hooks. There's the puzzling hook. This makes you ask questions of the story straight away and what the hell's going on. The direct address hook, you're spoken to directly and feel involved from the start. The subtle hook, this appeals to your sense of curiosity. Who is she? What's going on? The atmospheric hook, this is descriptive and could evoke any variety of moods. The visual hook appeals to our sense of sight. The funny hook, this is a tricky hook and only works if it appeals to your sense of humour. So, you know, it has to be fairly broad. The direct speech hook, this implies lots of action and a fast pace. Now, I have attached a uh, document to class charts that um, has got examples of the different hooks and you have to uh, match them up. Um, just spend 10 minutes on that. Um, yeah, so I'll be interested to see how you get on with that. And here are the answers. A cold, wet and damp day in December. The clouds were so low they seemed to trail their mist in the treetops and already at half past three it was dark within the forest. That's atmospheric. Our classroom looked smashing. Lots of silver tinsel and crepe paper and lanterns. We even had fairy lights. This is a visual hook. It appeals to your sense of sight. When Bill Simpson woke up on Monday morning he found he was a girl. He was standing staring, staring at himself in the mirror quite baffled when his mother swept in. Why don't you wear this pretty pink dress, she said. Uh, the funny hook, uh, the direct speech hook. I don't care if your friend Darren has a python, a cockatoo and a marmoset monkey, said mum. The answer's still no. That's the direct speech hook. Now we're going to start reading Skin um, by uh, Roald Dahl. And we're going to be looking particularly at the main characters called Drioli. Uh, what do we learn about him and what tone has been set and how has that been achieved? Um, you can just answer the second one there by saying what type of narrative hook you think it is. Um, I'll read it for you. We can read it together. Hopefully you've got a printout of it and you're sitting there with it in your hand. If not, you're looking at it on the screen. Winter was a long time going. A freezing wind blew through the streets of the city and overhead the clouds moved across the sky. An old man who was called Drioli shuffled painfully along the sidewalk of the Rue de Rivoli. He was cold and miserable. He, he moved, glancing without any interest in the shop at the things in the shop windows. Perfumes, silk and shirts, diamonds, furniture, books. Then a picture gallery. He'd always liked picture galleries and found and had a sing and this one had a single canvas display on in the in the window. He stepped back to look at it. Suddenly there came to him a slight movement of the memory, a distant recollection of something somewhere he'd seen. He looked again. It was a landscape, a group of trees leaning over to one side as if blown by the wind, positioned sort of into the frame. So pinned to the frame, there was a little plaque, and on this it said, Shame Soutine, 1894 to 1943. He stared at the picture, wondering vaguely what there was about it that seemed familiar. Crazy painting, he thought, very strange and crazy, crazy. but I like it. Shame Soutine, Soutine. 
By God, he cried suddenly, my little friend with a picture in the finest shop in Paris. Just imagine that. The old man pressed his face closer to the window. He could remember the boy, and yes, quite clearly he could remember him, but when? The rest of it was not so easy to recollect. Right, that's lines 1 to 14. What do we learn about the character of Drioli? Just make a bullet point list of four or five things. And what tone has been set and how has this been achieved? So which hook is that? And I think it's a mixture of two really, isn't it? Just uh, 10 minutes tops on that. And here are the answer. He is old because he's shuffled, he is cold and he is unhappy. There is a feeling of unease due to the pathetic fallacy. The fact is it is set in winter, a freezing wind is blowing. This creates a sense that something bad may happen. Remember pathetic fallacies when the weather sets the mood of the right of the characters. The first character we are in, introduced to is old and very unhappy. And as far as the hooks are concerned, he has used an atmospheric hook through his description of the weather, but also a subtle hook through the description of the man. Um, so uh, if you haven't got that, then put it into your books. OK, now we're going to read lines 50 to 80, 15 to 87. You'll have to forgive me, I can't get my printer. It's chopping off the uh, first word in the first part of it, which isn't, or a bit of the first word, so that can be a problem, but I don't think so. So just follow along from, uh, from where we were a minute ago. It was so long ago. How long exactly? 20? No, more like 30 years, wasn't it? Wait a minute. Yes, it was the year before the war. The first war, 1913, that was it. And this Soutine, this ugly little boy whom he had liked, almost loved, for no reason at all than he could think of except that he could paint. How he could paint. It was coming back more clearly now. Where is it the boy had lived? Salit Fagareri, that was it. Then there was a studio with the single chair in it and the dirty red, so red sofa the boy had used for sleeping. The drunken parties, the cheap white wine, the furious quarrels, and, as always, the sad face of the boy thinking over his work. It was odd, Drioli thought, how weasley it all came back to him now, how each single small remembered fact seemed instantly to remind him of another time. There was that nonsense with the tattoo, for instance. Now that was a mad thing, if ever there was one. How had it started? Ah oh, yes, he had got rich one day, that was it, and he had bought lots of wine. He could see himself now as he entered the studio with the parcel of bottles under his arm, the boy sitting at the easel, and his, Drioli's own wife, standing in the centre of the room, posing for her picture. Tonight we shall celebrate, he said. We shall have a little celebration, us three. What is it that we celebrate, the boy asked, without looking up. Is it that you have decided to divorce your wife so she can marry me? No, Drioli said. We celebrate today because today I have made a great sum of money with my work. And I have made nothing. We can celebrate that also. The girl came across to look at the painting. Drioli came over also, holding a bottle in one hand, a glass in the other. The boy shouted, please, no. He snatched the canvas from the easel and stood it against the wall. But Drioli had seen it. It's marvellous. I like all the others that you do. It's marvellous. I love them all. The fact is, the boy said gloomily, that in themselves they are not nourishing. I cannot eat them. Still they are marvellous, Drioli said, handing him a glass of pale yellow wine. Drink it, drink it, he said. It will make you happy. Never, he thought, had he known a more unhappy person wung the gloomier face. Give me some more, the boy said. If we are to celebrate, then let us do it properly. Tonight we shall drink as much as we possibly can, Drioli said. I am exceptionally rich. I think perhaps I should go out and buy some more bottles. How many shall I get? Six. Six more, the boy said. Two for each. Good. I, I will go now and fetch them, and I will help you. The nearest, at the nearest cafe, Drioli bought six bottles of white wine, and they carried them back to the studio. Then they sat down again and continued to drink. Only the very, it is only the very wealthy who can afford to celebrate in this manner. That is true, the boy said. Isn't that true, Josie? Of course. Beautiful wine, Drioli said. It is a privilege to drink it. Steadily, methodically, they set about getting themselves drunk. The process was routine, but all the same, there was a certain ceremony to be observed. Listen, Drioli said at length. I, was a, I have a tremendous idea. I would like to have a picture, a lovely picture. It is this. I want you to paint a picture on my skin, on my back. Then I want you to tattoo over what you have painted so that it will be there always. You have crazy ideas, the boy said. I will teach you how to use the tattoo. It is easy. A child could do it. You are quite mad. What is it you want? I will teach you in two minutes. Impossible. Are you saying I do not know what I'm talking about? All I'm saying, the boy told him, is that you were drunk and this is a drunken idea. 
We could have my wife for a model, a study of Josie upon my back. It is no good idea, the boy said, and I could not possibly manage the tattoo. It is simple. I will undertake to teach you in two minutes. You shall see. I shall go now and bring the instruments. In half an hour, Drioli was back. I've brought everything, he cried, waving a brown suitcase. All the necessities of the tattooist are here in this bag. He placed the bag on the table, opened it, and laid out the electric needles and the small bottles of coloured inks. He plugged in the electric needle, then he took the instrument in his hand and pressed a switch. He threw off his jacket and rolled up his left sleeve. Now look, watch me and I will show you how easy it is. I will make a design on my arm here. See how easy it is? See how I draw a picture of a dog here upon my arm? The boy was intrigued. Now let me practice a little on your arm. With a buzzing needle he began to draw blue lines upon Drolli's arm. It is simple, he said. It is like drawing with pen and ink. There is no difference except that it is a lot slower. There is nothing to it. Are you ready? Shall we begin at once? The model, cried Drolli. Come on, Josie. He was in a bustle of enthusiasm, now arranging everything like a child preparing for some exciting game. Where will you have her? Where, where shall she stand? Let her be standing there by my dressing table. Let her be brushing her hair. I will paint her with her hair down over her shoulders and her brushing it. Tremendous, you are a genius. First, the boy said, I shall make an ordinary painting. Then if it pleases me, I shall tattoo you over it. With a wide brush, he began to paint upon the naked skin of the man's back. Be still now, be still. His concentration as soon as he began to paint was so great that it appeared somehow to neutralise his drunkenness. All right, he said at last to the girl. Far into the small hours of the morning, the boy worked. Trioli could remember that when the artist finally stepped back and said, it is finished, there was daylight outside and the sound of people walking in the street. I want to see it, Trioli said. The boy held up a mirror and Trioli craned his neck to look. Good God, he cried, it was a startling sight. The whole of his back was a blaze of colour, gold and green and black and red. The tattoo was applied so heavily, heavily it, looked like an, it looked almost like an impasto. The portrait was quite alive. It contained so much, so much characteristic of Soutine's other works. It's tremendous. I rather like it myself. The boy stood back, examining it critically. You know, he added, I think it's good enough for me to sign. Taking up the machine again, he inscribed his name in red ink on the right-hand side over the place where Droli's kidney was. Right. Some comprehension questions here. I'd like you to answer them in full sentences. Um, how long was it that how long ago was it that he had met Soutine? What could Su Soutine do so well? Why were they celebrating the night that Drioli is remembering? What was Drioli's idea and what did Soutine paint? Um, at six, do you have any idea where this story is going? Is that a kind of narrative hook? Have you been drawn in? Do you think you know what's going to happen? What technique is being used to, to recount the story of Soutine? So answer all of those in full sentences and uh, upload them at the end of the lesson, please. Thank you. And here's the answers. He had met him over 30 years ago. Soutine could paint well. Drioli wanted to celebrate because he had made a great deal of money. His idea was that Soutine would paint a picture on his back and then tattoo over it. Soutine painted a picture of Drioli's wife. Um, your opinion? Yes, it is an example of a puzzling hook. It's mainly a puzzling hook, this one. We wonder you know, what's going to happen. Not, you mean you do that in all stories, but this is very specifically wondering about one specific thing, what's going to happen. The technique being used is a flashback where the author goes back in time to fill in the missing parts of the story. So if you haven't got that, then uh, add that to your notes. Now we're going to read 89 to 125, so uh, follow along. There'll be some comprehension and uh, uh, comprehension, um, was not a test, but to test your comprehension at the end of uh, this little bit of reading. The old man who was called Drioli was standing in a sort of trance, staring at the painting in the window of the picture dealer's shop. It had, been, it had been so long ago, all that, almost as though it happened in another life. And the boy, what had become of him? He could remember now that after returning from the war, the first war, he had missed him and had questioned Josie. Where is my little painter? He is gone, she had answered. I do not know where. Perhaps he will return. Perhaps he will, who knows? That was the last time they had mentioned him. Shortly afterwards, they had moved to Le Havre, where, they were, where there were more sailors and business was better. Those were the pleasant years, the years between the wars, with the small shop near the docks and the comfortable rooms and the always enough work. 
Then had come the second war, and Joseph being killed, and the Germans arriving, and that was the finish of his business. No one had wanted pictures on their arms any more after that, and by that time he was he was he was uh, um, too old for any other kind of work. In desperation, he has made his way back to Paris, hoping vaguely that it would be easier in the big city. Things would be easier in the big city, but they were not. And now, after the war was over, he possessed neither the means nor the energy to start up his small business again. It wasn't very easy for an old man to know what to do, especially when one did not like to. Um, feed, uh, especially one did not like to beg. But how else could he keep alive? He thought, still he thought still staring at the picture. So that is my little friend. He put his face closer to the window and looked into the gallery. On the walls he could see many other pictures and all seemed to be the work of the same artist. There was a great number of people strolling around. Obviously as it was a special exhibition. On a sudden impulse, Droli turned, pushed open the door of the gallery and went in. It was long with a thick wine coloured carpet and by God how beautiful and warm it was. There were all these people strolling about looking at the pictures, well-washed, dignified people, each of whom held a catalogue in the hand. He heard a voice beside him saying, what is it you want? Trioli stood still. A oh, please, the man in the back seat was saying, take yourself out of my gallery. Am I not permitted to look at the pictures? I have asked you to leave. Trioli stood his ground. He felt suddenly overwhelmingly outraged. Let us not have trouble, the man was saying. Come on now. Come on now. This He put a fat white hand on Drioli's arm and began to push him firmly toward the door. That did it. Take your goddamn hands off me, Drioli shouted. His voice rang clear down the long gallery and all the heads turned around as one. All the startled faces staring down the length of the room at the person who had made this noise. The people stood still, watching the struggle. Their faces expressed only an interest and seemed to be saying, It's all right. There's no danger for us. It's being taken care of. Droni was shouting, I too have a picture by this painter. He was my friend and I have a picture he gave me. He's mad. Someone should call the police. With a twist of the body, Droni suddenly shook off the man and before anyone could stop him was running down the gallery shouting, I'll show you, I'll show you, I'll show you. He flung off his overcoat, his jacket and shirt and he turned so that his naked back was towards the people. There, he cried, breathing quickly. You see, there it is. Right, that's up to line 125. So, what happened to Drody after the Second World War? Why is Drody asked to leave the gallery? Why does he take off his clothes? What do you think will happen next? What is so effective about how Roald Dahl has written this story so far? So, uh, full uh, sentence answers to those, please. And here are the answers. His wife died, his business dried up and he returned to Paris. It's a very smart gallery and Drioli looks run down. He takes off his clothes to show the tattoo of the painting. Uh, the number four is obviously just your opinion. Uh, we are still not sure where the story is going. We are invested in wanting to know what is going to happen after we read the flashback about Drioli and Soutine. I wonder if you've got any ideas about what you think might happen. Anyway, answer those questions in full sentences and uh, upload your word to class charts. Thank you very much for your nine.